and also welcome to the big bold Jewish climate fest that is happening between now and Sunday. Make sure to check out the, the dozens, if not hundreds of opportunities, um, including I'll plug a um, panel on Sunday with the CEO of Olam Diana Ginsburg. She'll be speaking about the Shemitah year that will be starting this year at Rosh, Rosh Hashanah. And the um, alum's honored to be a part of this and the whole idea of the festival is to really make climate change a moral issue and moral call in the Jewish community. And a reminder, this is a festival, not a conference. So feel free to put on your video at the end of the panel. We're going to open it up for discussion and dialogue um, for you to interact with our panelists today. So my name is Amy Weiss, and I'm the Director of Jewish Communal Engagement and Learning at Olam, based outside Washington, D.C. and Maryland. And want to give my colleague Yael a shout out for doing the behind the scenes um, tech for me today. So today we'll be discussing the impact of climate change on the developing world and the disproportionate effects that um, climate change has on the developing world. We'll also learn about how Jewish and Israeli organizations are working to combat the dire effects of climate change in the developing world. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that today is Tu B'Shvat, a Jewish holiday and celebration um, of nature. Um, often we call it the, the celebration of trees. And one thing I wanna mention in Judaism is that there are two words, Adam and Adama, human beings and earth that are intrinsically linked that have the same root and really highlight that in Judaism, earth and human beings are interconnected and one. They can't exist without the other. Um, and they have both positive and negative effects on one another. And as we're experiencing this awful pandemic that's continuing to rage on, we understand that borders and boundaries don't matter. What happens in one county, one state, one country affects the other. And nowhere is this more clear than with climate change and how it affects the entire world, how our actions here in America affect places elsewhere and vice versa. So we are excited to delve into this topic. Before I do, I'm going to introduce you a little bit more to Olam and then we'll get into our panel. So Olam is a network of over 50 Jewish and Israeli organizations working in the developing world around international development, global service, and humanitarian aid. Our vision is a global Jewish people that supports and partners with vulnerable countries around the world in order to foster justice, compassion, and equality all over the world. Our mission is inspired by Jewish values and the highest ethical standards. We convene practitioners, mobilize leaders, and organize the Jewish community to make global causes a central part of the Jewish people. How we do this, our main goals are to empower Jewish leaders around the world to become champions for global service, international development, and humanitarian aid. Bring together Jewish and Israeli practitioners all around the world to collaborate, build each other up and learn best practices and do their work better and stronger. And we increase the visibility of our partners and global issues within the Jewish community. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce you to three incredible Olam partners today that do deep climate change work. Before I do that, if you're not on mute, please go ahead and mute yourself. There'll be time at the end where we can unmute and engage in conversation. So our panel today, it's my pleasure to introduce Pyle Patel, um, Senior Program Officer of Land, Water, and Climate Justice at American World Service, Rabbi Micha Odenheimer, Founder and Rabbi of Tevel B'Tzedek, and Yonatan Merrill, Rabbi Yonatan Merrill, Founder and Executive Director of the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development. And instead of rattling off their impressive um, biographies, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, and all of our panelists have dedicated their life to service for those most vulnerable populations around the world. So I'd love to start with you, Pyle, if you can tell us how you got into this work and how your work intersects with climate change. Sure thing. Well, thank you um, so much, uh, Amy. It's a pleasure to be here and what an exciting and important 
event this festival is. I'm, I'm really honored to, to be part of this conversation with my truly impressive co-panelists. Um, I'll start just by telling you a little bit about my personal background. Um, my family and I were originally from Kenya and, um, and, and sort of that identity has certainly shaped the way that I was raised uh, with, a, with a really sort of global perspective on, on social issues, including issues relating to justice and inequality. Um, but I became especially passionate about um, human rights, social justice and women's rights in particular when I was an undergraduate and got involved in a number of international human rights campaigns. Um, a few years after I graduated college um, is when Al Gore's documentary on climate change and inconvenient truth was released. And watching that, um, that documentary was a really pivotal experience for me um, because it really opened up my eyes for the first time to understanding the full scale of the impending climate crisis. And, and it propelled me also to get involved in raising awareness about climate change as a critical policy issue here in the US. Um, subsequently in graduate school, I, I actually focused um, more of my learning and studies around the intersection of human rights, community development and climate change in the global south. And thereafter worked as a researcher and pro program specialist for a number of years um, on issues relating to women's empowerment, land rights and rural development in East Africa. And even when I was doing that work about eight to 10 years ago, it was really clear to me that climate change was negatively impacting small farmers in that region, especially women. And now more recently over the past six years at American Jewish World Service, I've been really lucky to be able to work squarely on the intersection of climate change and human rights. Just to give you a brief background, AJWS uh, is a grant making and an advocacy organization that's been in existence for 35 years. Um, our work advances human rights and justice in 18 countries in the global south, in Africa, Mesoamerica, and Asia. And our grant making specifically prioritizes support to grassroots organizations and social movements that are working on several issues, one of which is land, water, and climate justice. And that's the issue that I focus on in my grant making role at, AJ, at AJWS, specifically on two regions of East Africa and West Africa. I'll just end by saying that it's been an incredibly rewarding experience for me to be able to directly support and really learn from the activists and grassroots organizations that we fund that are working at this really critical intersection of fighting for human rights as they're also trying to combat climate change. Fantastic, thank you so much. And we're excited in our next section to delve more into that intersectionality with your work. Um, Micha, now to you, can you share a little bit of your background, how you got into this work and the intersection with your work in climate change? Okay, I grew up in the States and I moved to Israel in uh, 1988. And uh, I'm a rabbi, but I was also, I'm also a writer and I was working as a journalist and I flew to Ethiopia um, and started to cover the, uh, the immigration or the Aliyah of Ethiopian Jews who were really uh, coming down from Gondor and down into Addis Ababa. They were really the first sort of refugees from internal refugees that I met. I didn't really know at the time how important that would become. And, uh, and I ended up starting to cover uh, stories from all over, from Haiti, Somalia, Nepal, um, crisis places, Iraq, and got very, very interested in globalization. And um, uh, especially economic globalization and what that was doing to the most vulnerable populations, which in many countries were the majority. Um, and um, after traveling with my family, I took my family on a trip for two and a half months to India in 2005, I saw how many young Israelis were uh, traveling there and that some of them really would have really wanted something you know, deeper, uh, deeper engagement. And so started Tevel Betzedek in 2007 as uh, primarily in the beginning, a kind of an educational program, but very quickly shifted to understanding that if we wanted to really make it uh, an impact, a transformational impact on poverty, that we had to uh, start working in rural villages and work for three, three to five years at a time um, on agriculture, community building, um, women's issues, and uh, so that's what we've well, that's what we've done for the past uh, you know 10, 11 years. Um, we've worked in Nepal, Haiti, Zambia, and Burundi. 
Um, and now we're pretty much hibernating during the COVID for various reasons that make it very hard for us to work, but we're gearing up to get started again and uh, actually putting out um, uh, a call for um, new cohorts of volunteers to come in, uh, in June uh, to Zambia. We're, our, our main work is through professionals and through partnerships with the local organizations in the countries, but we also bring in volunteers because we feel that it's really important to create um, a young generation of Israelis and Jews who are super committed to this, uh, to this work. Amazing, thank you so much. And thank you to those introducing yourself in the chat. We have people from all over the world. Um, if you haven't done so, put your name and location in there and welcome. And also feel free to add questions as we go. Um, at the end, we will open this up. There's also links in the chat to these organizations and more information. I now would love to turn it over to Yonatan to share about his background and work with the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development. Great, thank you, Amy. I grew up in California on an acre of land with an organic garden that I garden with my mother. I first went to the Global South uh, in Mexico when I was in high school, but my first real experience was on an American Jewish World Service alternative spring break trip to Ciudad Romero in El Salvador when I was in college, uh, which was a very eye-opening experience for me. Uh, I then um, did research in India for a summer in uh, Northern India and lived for a month with a uh, family in Ladakh in the northernmost part of India. And uh, also did research in Mexico on a different summer on genetically modified corn and uh, lived with a family in Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, and also studied abroad in Cuba for a semester. So those were my, that's how I got into this. Um, and my organization, the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development reveals the connection between religion and ecology and mobilizes people to act. And we're collaborating with Gigawatt Global, an Israeli solar energy platform, to promote a faith-inspired renewable energy project in Mozambique uh, to develop a commercial scale solar field in one of the world's poorest places. Amazing. We're honored to have all of you here today. So to get into the, the conversation um, and really focus in on what is the impact of climate change on the developing world. And uh, Micha, I'd like to start with you. Much of your work focuses on climate migration, climate refugees. And often when we think about refugees, we think about people moving from country to country. But oftentimes climate change affects people within their own country and displacement within their own space. So can you explain to us what climate migration is, what the effects are in vulnerable communities, and particularly in Nepal, where you've done most of, a lot of your work? You're on mute, Micha. Very good, awesome. there you go. Um, so um, first of all, most of our work is not really with um, people who've already migrated, it's to try to help prevent migration um, because um, migration is uh, very, especially vulnerable migration is uh, very, very problematic. So um, what the problem is, okay, Nepal stretches from like 70 meters below above sea level all the way up to Mount Everest. So there's a whole huge watershed and in each place and each elevation, there, is, uh, there are different, uh, different results or impacts of climate change. Where we are in, the, in our villages, we mostly work, not only, but mostly work in mid hills, which is about 2000 feet to about 6,000 feet high, where the majority of the, the great deal of population is, is located. And what's happening there with climate change, a few things are happening. First of all, there's a, a, um, an interruption in rain patterns and people who are, uh, you know, most of the, the villages or subsistence farming villages, they depend on knowing when the rain is gonna come. And it used to come almost like clockwork in Nepal. So I've been in a village where they've planted the corn and they know they have eight days until they get rain. And if, they, if it stretches out beyond eight days to 12 days, 15 days, the seeds are gonna rot and they're gonna lose their whole corn crop, which may entail, which may mean that they have to migrate. Um, and just seeing them waiting for, waiting for the rain, but the rain, the rain doesn't come. Um, then another huge problem in the area we worked in called Rami Chop is that the rain, there would be as much rain coming down as, uh, as usual, but it would come down 
in huge and very strong outbursts and in a shorter period of time. And what that would mean was that the earth couldn't absorb the water in the way it usually would. And the water would roll down, flood the down villages. But in, the, in, the, in those villages, the wells, the wells or the springs that they depended on from the monsoon until the coming May, uh, coming June or May, wouldn't, wouldn't get recharged. So these, these springs that would have water within them the whole, you know, the whole year now, after a couple of months, would have no water left in them. And another thing that we would see, we saw, is that it's very, very much dependent, things depend on microenvironments. So in the same area, uh, you know, you have the northeast side of the mountain and the southeast side of the mountain, and the northeast side of the mountain would be more or less okay, and the southeast side of the mountain would be in complete drought. So it really, um, you know, really depends on that. And of course, implications are huge. It's not only water for agriculture, of course, livelihood, it's water for drinking. It means people have to spend lots and lots of time trying to get water. It means that the women are more vulnerable as because it's their jobs and how to go to get the water. Uh, it means that kids aren't going to school because of that, uh, because they have to go get water. Um, everything changes. And um, oftentimes people really will have to migrate into, into slums or into very vulnerable work situations uh, because of climate change. And, uh, you know, we see, we see that in many, 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 many places in, in Nepal and also in other places we work in Africa and other places that we work. Thank you. I know often these issues can feel so overwhelming and we're certainly going to get into how we get involved, right? How do we not use um, being overwhelmed as an excuse, but, but take action in this, this huge, huge issue around the world. Um, Pyle, I want to turn over to you. Uh, many of the developing countries and developing countries are struggling in a rapidly changing environment world. And many people in the developing world are reliant on their land um, for survival and sustenance. So I would love to hear from you. What, what are some of the specific threats to people's lands um, in the developing, con in developing countries and what um, effect does it have on the community? Thanks, Sammy. Yeah, I have a lot of similar reflections to Mika, um, you know, in terms of what, what he spoke about in the, in the Nepal context, in East Africa, which is, again, one of the regions that I work on, we've also seen in similar, um, we've also seen in recent years, um, sort of similar occurrences, natural disasters induced by climate change. So recurrent, longer periods of drought, um, as well as opposing bouts of flooding. Those have been two particularly prominent impacts um, in Kenya and Uganda specifically. You know, these natural disasters are wreaking havoc um, for, for farming communities and, and particularly for women who are actually responsible for doing the bulk of subsistence farming um, in Sub-Saharan Africa to, to feed their families. Um, just as Mika spoke about also, I mean, we're seeing this around the world, it's not just in the global south, certainly also in the, in the US and the global north, but the impacts of climate change on weather patterns, making them much more unpredictable are, are, are seemingly getting worse and worse each year, as Mika spoke about really powerfully. Um, you know, farmers also in, in East Africa and West Africa are, are completely hamstrung in terms of knowing now when to plant their crops because it used to be a, around very traditional and, um, you know, has, and patterns around when the rains would fall, when the dry seasons would be. So that's wreaking havoc on crop outputs which of course so many families, um, rural communities are, are dependent on for their own subsistence livelihoods, as well as um, those crops that they take to market. Um, in East Africa, many rural and indigenous communities also depend very much so on livestock for their livelihood. And so the droughts that we've seen there in recent years um, again, as Mika said, impact not just um, farming and drinking water, but they're also depleting the water sources and the grazing land that are critical for the, for the survival of life, livestock. So that's actually resulted in the mass death of cows and other livestock. So between crop uh, failures or diminished um, outputs on crops, as well as starvation of livestock, 
just over the last few years in East Africa alone, you know, millions of people in the region have been experiencing food insecurity. So I, I just wanted to reflect, you know, that this is one of the most devastating um, aspects of the climate crisis, which you talked about, Amy, in your introduction, which is that vulnerable communities such as these farming communities, um, fisher folk, indigenous people around the world who have really done the least to cause climate change through emissions of um, greenhouse gases have now for many years been um, bearing that a disproportionate burden. Um, but I also want to, um, I think it's important to also look upstream. So not just at the direct impacts of climate change, but also at two of the major causes of climate change and how they're impacting these vulnerable communities in the global south. And those, those two causes relate to how we produce our energy and food. So certainly we all know that burning of fossil fuels for energy is one of the biggest contributors to climate change, but it's sometimes less, less well known that agricultural, sorry, that large scale industrial agriculture also emits greenhouse gases like methane and requires intensive use of chemical pesticides. Not only do these forms of energy and food production emit massive amounts of greenhouse gases around the world, but the noxious byproducts they release can also and have been rendering farmland and drinking water toxic for many local communities in the global south. Um, so this means that food production and, and drinking water are somewhat impossible in some communities and hence really the basis for sustaining life is at risk. Um, and these means of food and energy production are also major drivers of illegal land and forest grabs by governments in the global south. And the, in turn, these land grabs are unjustly displacing countless small farmers um, and economically marginalized people from their homes each year. Thank you, Pyle. I think, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction and you just mentioned, so much of the effects of climate change are harming and hurting those that are, that are least um, contributing to the cause. And as um, we spoke about with, with Chubishvat, right, we're, we're all intrinsically linked that um, there's a in Judaism, right? It's a team that everybody's made in the image of God and that we have to know that sustaining ourselves and the choices we make um, affect others. And how do we not only sustain ourselves but the entire world and those around the world? Yonatan, I wanna to turn to you. Uh, you recently in the Eco Bible, which is a commentary on the books of Genesis and Exodus. And um, as we face huge environmental changes and um, drastically shifting weather patterns, I'm curious what the Bible, what Tanakh can tell us about climate change and how it compels us to action. Thanks for asking. Uh, here's, here's the book, Eco Bible, uh, volume one, an ecological commentary on Genesis and Exodus. The Bible has a lot to say. And I, I believe that if we're going to address climate change, that we're going to need to draw deep on religious traditions in order to do that. You know, since 1992, the nations of the world have been negotiating to curb greenhouse gas emissions. And amazingly, every year that they negotiate, the emissions go up. And uh, Gus Beth, who was the dean of the Yale School of Forestry and Religious Studies, said that he thought that 30 years of good science would help us to solve the ecological crisis. But he realized that he was wrong because the crisis isn't really about fossil fuels or plastic pollution or biodiversity loss, the crisis we're facing is about apathy and greed and arrogance and short-term thinking. And unless we address the spiritual roots of the crisis, which scientists are unable to do, we're not going to sufficiently solve it. So we've, we've dug deep in the rabbinic tradition we've, and we're bringing to light hundreds of rabbinic commentators who, have, who share ecological insights. We're commenting on 450 verses in volumes one and two. Uh, we're going to be publishing volume two in the coming months, I'll just give you one example. It says in Genesis chapter two, verse 15, Eden God placed the human being in the garden of Eden to serve it and conserve it. That's how Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory translates it, that we are here to be stewards of creation. You know, there's a, a deep held <clears throat> religious view that many people have that we can essentially trash God's planet and that the Messiah will come and wave a magic wand and it'll all just go away. All the problems will be solved, all the plastic. It's sort of like uh, in Dr. Seuss's uh, amazing book, The Cat in the Hat Comes Back. If anyone's read that, there's a deep, there's something to that, that, that you know, when we reach a state of redemptive consciousness and when we increase our, our level of spiritual living, um, that hopefully these problems will be solved by our spiritual evolution. 
Um, but, but part of what we're revealing in this commentary, which is both about theology and practice, so we have practical action items, is that we need to, in, we need to bridge spirituality and sustainability, religion and ecology. And, and, that, and when, so we're doing that for, based on the Bible, which is considered a holy book for 2.2 billion people. And, and part of the work of the Interfaith Center is, is working with people who are active in Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism in, on religion and ecology and their traditions. Fantastic. I uh, recommend everybody going and purchasing their, theirs after this if they don't own it already. Um, so we, we just heard just a, a piece of the dire effects that climate change is having in the developing world. Unfortunately, the list sort of goes on and on. Um, and I really want to shift now to the innovative solutions that all of you are a part of around the world and to offer um, some hope in tackling this large issue. And all of you are working with partners and local communities to combat these dire effects of um, climate change. And Pyle, I want to start with you. AGWS works with grassroots organizations all over the world um, about the intersection of human rights, land rights, and climate change. Can you share about some of AGWS's grantees and how they are combating climate change on the ground and what that looks like? Sure. Thanks, Amy. Um, well, first, I just want to start actually by briefly explaining what we mean by climate justice, which is the approach that AJWS uses to tackle climate change. So as I mentioned earlier, right, we talked about the types of communities who have done the least to contribute to the climate crisis, often being the ones who are facing an, um, some of its heaviest costs. So climate change seeks to ensure that these communities have a voice and a role in addressing the problem. And in general, that's actually a core principle of our work at AJWS, which is that those on the front lines of experiencing a problem should also be at the center of identifying the solutions. So driven by those principles, along with uh, values like tikkun olam, here at AJWS, we, we're prioritizing supporting some some of the most marginalized communities in the countries where we work. So for example, forest dependent communities in Kenya, indigenous Mayans in Guatemala, tribal Adivasis in India, all of whom have a deep historical and cultural connection to their land and territories. So all of our grassroots partners actually from these and other communities um, around the world are advocating for their rights to continue to live on their land and in their forests and to fundamentally have a say in how those natural resources are used. And critically, they're also themselves practicing sustainable management of land, water, um, and their forests. Um, some of our grantees in Africa and Southeast Asia and India and Guatemala are also trying to prevent unchecked deforestation from going on. And this is, of course, especially critical for mitigating the climate crisis because we know that forests around the world are um, a major carbon sink. They absorb billions of, of tons of carbon dioxide and it's critical to keep that carbon in the ground. Um, other partners are also resisting fossil fuel energy development. So for example, in Kenya and Thailand and in India, some of our grantee partners are advocating that their government stop supporting fossil fuel energy projects such as new coal plants and coal mining, which are slated to, to start happening anytime soon. And so they're really resisting those. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're trying to convince policymakers and the broader public in their countries about why it's so critical to invest in a new form of development and one that um, really values and supports and, and puts you know, investments into renewable energy. Um, another innovative solution that a number of our small farmer and our indigenous led organizations are practicing and scaling up has to do with sustainable forms of farming. So this includes agroecological farming methods, which are based on the principle that farming should enhance species diversity and maintain healthy soil through natural and scientific methods, but also rooted in indigenous and traditional practices that had worked for, for many generations. So agroecology also helps to address the impacts of climate change because many of the traditional seed varieties that it supports and tries to resuscitate are actually more drought resistant than some of the varieties that are produced by agricultural companies. And our grantee partners and allies really view agroecology and, and other forms of sustainable localized farming to be a key solution to the climate crisis. And this is because as I mentioned earlier, industrial agriculture and, and all of its intensive use of pesticides um, 
is and, and release of methane is a key contributor to the, the climate crisis. So at AJWS, that's why we not only fund partners who are supporting agroecological farming, but we're also trying to um, convince other funders to also to invest in it as well. And I just will close by saying that while these solutions are being implemented in very localized ways, they really transcend specific communities and, and national boundaries. And you know that's in part because social justice groups, communities, um, activists around the world, including here in the US are implementing similar solutions. Um, on the ground as they also push for more expansive and more supportive policy changes. And I'd say that they're all really part of an ever-growing movement on climate change and climate justice, which is increasingly connecting the local to the global in really clear and powerful ways. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I think for a lot of individuals, especially um, within some Jewish communities, we're, we're very urban focused and often forget the role of land that plays around the world and, and where our food comes from and taking the time to think about how that just has a trickle down effect in everything we do. Um, Yonatan, in your work, you work across <coughs> religious faiths to create a more sustainable future. Can you tell us the role that faith leaders play in local countries? Um, in developing countries and local communities to create more sustainable solutions in their communities? Sure, I'd be happy to. First of all, as I mentioned, we're working in Mozambique on a faith-inspired renewable energy project, and we're collaborating with Green Anglicans and the Anglican Church of Southern Africa. So Bishop Vicente is uh, collaborating with us and along with Gigawatt Global to develop a commercial scale solar field on church land. So that's an example of a faith leader who most of his congregants uh, are living on, you know, around $2 a day. Uh, Nyasa province in Northern Mozambique is one of the poorest places in the world. And most of his congregants don't have access to electricity and the ones that do, it's not a stable access. And so here he is and he's pioneering a, uh, you know, 10 megawatt uh, solar field development. So that's an example of a faith leader taking leadership in renewable energy. Uh, if, if, if we were see, see, to see the scale, then a lot of the energy poverty that's endemic to Africa and uh, some other places in the world, uh, you know, would, would be significantly reduced. Uh, I also had an interesting meeting with uh, the Archbishop of Burundi, the former Archbishop, uh, who was also the, the Anglican liaison to the Vatican. And I asked him, tell me in your country, Burundi, uh, where there's about 11 and a half million people and a million have already left as refugees because of instability and violence. What do you, how do you view the biblical command in the first chapter of Genesis to be fruitful and multiply? Uh, and his country is one of the poorest in the world also. I know Micha has, has done work there. Uh, and he said, look, that command is uh, no longer applicable in our country because there's not enough food to go around and uh, it doesn't make sense to be having, you know, uh, eight children in a family when you can't, we can't, we're not able to support those children to, to lead a, a stable life. Uh, and so that's another aspect that my organization has been doing some thought leadership on is, you know, trying to bring religious leaders to, to speak more about sustainability and to train clergy um, and to sort of challenge some of the sacred cows uh, within religion, including this idea that we need to be fruitful and multiply uh, from now till kingdom come, no matter what the cost and um, without regard to sustainability. Thank you so much. And I think, you know, what this climate fest is all going to make that um, call to the Jewish community, a moral call to all of us to be involved. But, you know, it, it's going to take all faiths, all people, all leaders to really combat the effects of climate change. Um, Micha, in Tevel Betzedek, um, you have focused on agriculture and food production, um, you know, as people's baseline for food and income. And you've witnessed a lot of people being displaced or their lands not being fruitful. Um, how have you worked to keep people in their homes and continue to have the, the land grow to sustain communities? Yeah, well, I would, say, I would say two things. First of all, not everybody is going to necessarily be a farmer in the next generation, but even those that aren't, um, even those that aren't, it's very important for us to strengthen the villages so that their migration eventually uh, will be safe. So that those members of their family or their community that stay there can provide them the support they need to start over 
in a in 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 the city or wherever they go. So it's important. But our main work is really trying to strengthen strengthen the villages. As Payal pointed out, um, f the the villages are important not only for the people who are living there and for their culture and their community. It's one thing that happens when people migrate is that they lose that community. They go go will go into slums and they're actually even though there's so many more people there, they're very very isolated oftentimes. Um, but um, so. Um, what what we what we found is that um, that community, um, you know, we we work with agriculture, um, but everything we do is actually about strengthening agriculture through working with community. So first of all, of course, we bring new agriculture. We can help bring new agricultural techniques. Um, that means first of all, diversifying because. Many, many times, um, both in Africa and in Nepal um, and elsewhere, uh, subsistence farming villages are relying on just a few kinds of basic foods. So if we diversify the kinds of foods that they're growing and, of course, use, uh, as Payal pointed out, indigenous seeds are often more resistant to climate change than, than, the, than the hybrids that, that are being brought in. Um, new kinds of techniques, but really diversifying the kinds of crops that are being grown. Um, and uh, also techniques to protect the crops. Um, and then of course, bringing in new kinds of livelihoods. So for example, in this area, I remember I told you that there was uh, you know, two areas, the Northeast and the Southeast, and the Southeast was in dire, um, uh, you know, was, was really uh, in a drought. But what we found is that we could introduce Moton very successfully beekeeping there in a way that would actually uh, sustain them. So we trained people in, in beekeeping and then also planted thousands of trees, uh, churi trees that provide sustenance for, for, uh, uh, for the bees. Um, so diversifying their, their, now another thing that you can do is you also have to, you can work with the land, you work with terraces, you work with building terraces, you work with preparing the land to be able to absorb um, the rain, but but the community part, the community organizing part, is absolutely crucial. Um, mobilizing women, empowering women, um, mobilizing the community in order to be able to take their to take their uh, to collectively bargain. Um, you know what we're trying to do is to move people from subsistence farming, which isn't really working now, to small scale commercial farming. So they have to find a way to get together and to bring their food to market together and to be able to bargain collectively. The more food they have, the more crop they have, the more bargaining power uh, they have. So creating those institutions and over a period of three to five years, staying in the community, it's very important for us that our local um, hires who don't necessarily come from the village stay in the village, that our volunteers stay in the village, that there's an eye to eye communication that people not only work in groups, but also work in their own fields. And also what we found, which was, which was very, very powerful, was to create cadres of volunteers that were stipending for a two-year period, three-year period from the village itself. Um, so always working, you know, as we're looking at the macro, it's also crucial to work um, uh, from the grassroots up. Um, and, um, I think that the you know another really important um, really important thing is to is to give people skills also beyond agriculture, so that eventually the community can can also diversify, and if they do migrate, their mi migration uh, uh, will be safe. Now, one more thing is that I, I would say sometimes people say, oh, you're giving you're not only giving people fish, you're giving people um, uh, fishing rods, teaching them how to fish. But I would say no, we're teaching them how to fish maybe. Although they know a lot themselves, we're just working with their knowledge and bringing in some new techniques and some new ideas, helping them to organize. But I'd say beyond teaching people to fish, we're teaching them to organize so that they can control what's happening in the river. That's like really important. So for example, if you have a community in Zambia, for example, that we're working with, that's surrounded by sugarcane people who are, who are you know, trying to use all of the water for commercial sugarcane. 
How can these people organize and fight back against uh, against that? How can people, you know, obviously we're not, we can't organize people politically, but we can organize them enough and empower them enough so that they can take the local politics into their hands. And that's often very, very crucial. So we believe that by, by strengthening the local communities, in the end, we're strengthening the whole you know, sort of value chain and the, the ability of the, of the countries to support themselves uh, in terms of food, which I think as we've seen with Corona, um, it was increasingly important not to, be able, not to have to rely on, on, uh, on, on trade. Thank you. And I think you know, it, it continues to point to, I mean, COVID unfortunately has um, blown open the idea that right borders and boundaries no longer matter. And, um, and it not only has to be top down, but from bottom up and that, you know, non-governmental organizations, governmental organizations, nonprofits, local communities all need to work together in order to overcome these huge um, issues within climate change. I wanna move on to the Jewish community and how to mobilize the Jewish community around this cause. All of your organizations have it as a central tenet to um, mobilize Jewish communities towards action, whether it's around climate change or other social justice issues in the global world. Um, this is obviously a central tenet of what we do at Olam to inspire the Jewish community um, to assist the most vulnerable communities around the world. So Yonatan, I wanna start with you. Um, what do you see as the role of the global Jewish community in building a sustained future? Um, and how can the Jewish community make this a more central tenant of what we do? Great question. So, I mean, the focus of my work, as I mentioned, is connecting religion and ecology. And you know, here, uh, the capital of the Jewish people is here in Jerusalem, where Micha and I are located. And uh, I believe that uh, the Jew one way the Jewish people can exercise leadership is by revealing that uh, religious teachings have deep things to say on sustainability. You know, the Jewish people are our claim to fame is the Torah. There's uh, that's you know, I mean, we've had Einstein, we've had great thinkers, but uh, the 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 I think our our and 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 it's our spiritual leadership, in my opinion. You know. I, I believe that part of the challenge that we're facing with climate change is that is the ascendance of consumer society and people living uh, for pleasure, seeking instant self-gratification, which is really living at a certain low level of soul awareness. And I believe that our people has a spiritual role to help humanity to raise up our level of soul awareness. The, according to the mystical teachings, a human being has five levels of soul and, and if we live at a higher level of soul awareness, uh, we're going to get at the deeper roots of the problem. Henry David Thoreau said that for every hundred people hacking at the branches of the tree of evil, one person's hacking at the roots. And the Rashba writing in 13th century Spain says that if you get at the root issues, the peripheral issues will fall away. So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't switch to renewable energy. My organization's actively promoting that. Um, but, but who knew that the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe said 40 years ago that we should switch to solar energy? And, and where is that? And he didn't just say that for the Jewish people. He said that for the entire United States. Uh, and he said that to Ronald Reagan. So, you know, I, I think that, that, that Jewish people can exercise moral leadership by digging deep into our tradition and, and revealing how we can bring these teachings to bear on the ecological crisis. Soul awareness. I'm going to take that with me and put it as my mantra on my mirror every morning. That's beautiful. Thank you. And I think so often we forget these universal um, principles that exist all over the world that also have these particular roots in, in our Jewish faith. And uh, Micha, you bring Jewish and Israeli volunteers all over the world to work on some of these causes. What are you hoping they'll do after their experience at Tebel B'Tzedek? And how do you hope they'll influence the Jewish community's involvement in issues such as climate change? Right. So I would say that, first of all, within Judaism, there's been like this split between, um, you know, sort of when the Enlightenment came and Jews could supposedly become part of uh, Western society, although it didn't work out so well in some places, um, the Jewish world split into two. And it split into people who, you know, the sort of the Jewish Jews who said, well, the ghetto walls have come down, but we better build them up strong again, at least virtually, because we need to keep our tradition and we need to keep our identity. And then other people who said, look, we're gonna bring 
what's really important about Judaism, which is the ethics, ethical monotheism, we're going to bring that into the world, the spirit of the prophets. And I think that that was a, that was a modern split. And now our task is to bring those two things together to say, we have to, just as Yonatan is saying, we can dig deeply into our tradition. And in fact, um, that can be a way for us to truly encounter other people and recognize and come to them as saying, you know, we're a tribe, we're coming to a tribe. We're not the universalists coming, we're the universal and you're the tribe. We're both, we're both tribes. So I'm hoping, and, and we have to get together, we have to get together to make a home for, for humanity. So what I'm hoping that people will come back and do, first of all, that they'll come back strengthened in their, in their belief that they can make a difference and a passion to make a difference. And I, um, uh, a deep feeling of being connected to each other, of having this experience of being in a rural village, um, living like people in the village, knowing them, um, eating with them, um, working with them and coming and understanding that it, both that they have gifts to give and gifts to receive, but also that there is a deep connection uh, between all of us. Uh, I hope they also come back, you know, the part of our educational part with an understanding of the macro picture, macroeconomics and environmental dynamics and how they affect all of us, but at the same time a faith and an understanding that really change has got to come from the grassroots and strengthen the community if we expect it to happen just from coming from above and from governments, it's not gonna happen. It has to have, you know, what you call in Kabbalah, the root of the latata, an awakening from below, um, as well as the, uh, the, which will bring an awakening uh, uh, from above. So the centrality of community, people coming back and believing in the centrality of community. And finally, as I started with a belief that Judaism, Jewish identity, specific identity can actually be a tremendous wellspring for um, addressing uh, the problems of the world as long as our hearts are open, as long as you know our hearts are open to uh, to love the world and to see how uh, to see what a beautiful place it is and and, and can be. Beautiful, thank you. And pile um, to. GWS works so hard to mobilize the Jewish community around many causes and particularly focuses on advocacy as a vehicle for social change. So I'd love to, for you to speak to how advocacy um, plays a role in climate change and combating climate change and how the Jewish community can be more involved on the advocacy level. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, so, you know, as you've heard, of course, I've been speaking about our grant making work, which is what I um, have a role in, but we also have a small and, and mighty advocacy team. I'm actually joined on the call by one of my colleagues, Hannah Walbacher. Um, she, along with other colleagues, including Lilak Shafir and, and others in our advocacy team, um, are doing that engagement and, and work with the Jewish community. Um, so our advocacy efforts do really focus on, on US policies, right? That can have an impact around the world on our grantee partners and on the issues that, that they're addressing. Um, but we also have a Jewish engagement and education um, part of our work in which we um, educate rabbis who engage with us through a couple of um, uh, programs, one which is the Global Justice Fellowship Program, and a more recent you know, online program that we started called the Global Justice Kavara. And much in the way that we're been, we've been doing in this discussion, we really use those spaces, Hannah and Lilak and others are using those spaces to educate rabbis about how climate change is impacting our grantee partners in the South in the global south and, and how our partners are working to combat it. And, and through that education, rabbis are in turn mobilizing their congregations and their communities to, to get involved both in their communities, but also in terms of targeting um, the US government through advocacy. So certainly on climate change, as well as on so many issues, we know that the US has an outsized role um, for climate change. Of course, we've been one of the largest emitters of carbon historically, but, but the US can and really should be um, playing a clear role to, to push the world to take urgent action on the climate crisis. And so we've been excited about the, the first week of the Biden administration already taking some, some crucial and strong uh, steps on, on climate change through executive action. And so we're really seeing the next few years as a, a, much, um, a much more hopeful opportunity, certainly than the last four in terms of being able to engage with the new administration. Um, to ensure that it continues to really support this transition 
domestically um, towards a green economy and towards a more sustainable way of living, but that it also does so in ways that respect the rights um, of vulnerable communities in the global south as we make those energy and, and agricultural transitions. And that is the work um, that we're engaging with, um, with our rabbi partners on and, and with their congregations. Um, so, but I'll also say that really our bread and butter is certainly our, our, la our large grant making presence and, and our advocacy is, is targeted in, you know, in very specific ways where we think we can help to bring to bear the, the perspectives and the visions and the strategies of our grantee partners. And there's just so much to be doing collectively in this fight towards um, climate justice and particularly with the, the very engaged Jewish community. And so that's also why we work together with other organizations who are at the center of, of this fight um, in the US, including groups like Dayanu and Hazan, who are certainly helping to lead um, very bold and important work as well. We have to do this in, in partnership, you know, as other Mika and, and Amy has said at all levels, from the community to the local level, to the national and here in the US with, with a range of partnerships. That was a perfect segue. You spoke about some of the hope that's come with um, the new administration around climate change in particular. And, um, you know, in the midst of one of the worst global health um, catastrophes we've seen in a century, along with the effects we're seeing of climate change that are threatening our very existence, it's, it's easy to get paralyzed um, and overwhelmed by, by the enormity of the work that has to happen. Um, and at Olam, we try to offer constant inspiration from the work of our partners to see that change is possible um, and through collaboration, like you mentioned, Kyle, that we can move the, the, the world forward and offer justice for everyone. Um, so I do want to end uh, before we open it up for dialogue and questions on hope, right? We're again, we're seeing the world sort of being threatened on many levels, but I want to hear from you all. What brings you hope and inspiration in these uh, pretty tragic times? Micha, we'll start with you. So I'd say that one thing that uh, COVID surprised me with uh, was the fact that the world could stop. That that you know I thought that it was impossible. It was impossible to stop the the stop the flights and stop the businesses and stop. And not that I'm so happy about the governments imposing these kinds of things. I think it's a dangerous precedent, but I do think that it's a hopeful sign that once realize that something ha is happening that's you know really out of the ordinary that we can get together and to stop and to think. Um, now, if you you ask me what uh, you know for a phrase or a, a something, one of the one of the phrases, one of the psukim, one of the passages from the Torah that, or from the from the prophets, that gives me a lot of inspiration is from Ezekiel, where he says, "Vasiroti mikem et lev ha'even v'natati lachem bechem lev basar." I will take from you the um, heart of stone, and I will put in you a heart of flesh. And I really, truly do believe that human beings are not by nature greedy, that selfishness is, can also mean the selfishness of wanting to live in a deeply meaningful community where we understand that the most wonderful and joyful and, and exciting thing that we can do is to create a more just and beautiful world for, for everybody. And I, I truly believe that that can happen. So let's hope. Amazing. Yonatan, how about you? What's giving you inspiration during these uh, difficult times? Well, first of all, my Rebbe Micha has given me inspiration. So oh, okay. <laughs> thanks for your wise words. Um, you know, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs wrote, hope is a human virtue, but one with religious underpinnings. At its ultimate, it is the belief that God is mindful of our aspirations with us in our fumbling efforts, that God has given us the means to save us from ourselves, that we are not wrong to dream, wish, and work for a better world. Hope is the knowledge that we can choose, that we can learn from our mistakes and act differently next time. You know, I, in 1993, I first read about climate change when I was 13, and, and I was shaken in my boots because I thought, wow, you know, what these scientists are saying will come in by the year 2100, like what type of world will you know, will there be? And, you know, and unfortunately, the scientists were way off because it, climate change has showed up much faster and earlier than, than they anticipated. 
Um, but what gives me hope is that uh, it's really, climate change is really just a symptom of an illness. It's really just messaging to us that we need to live uh, more holy lives. We need to live with, uh, as, as net givers instead of net takers. Uh, and as Rabbi Nachman Abreslov said, Ein ush ba'olam klal, never give up hope. Uh, we have the ability, God is, you know, there's no challenge that, that, that's too big for us. God has given us the cure before the, the problem. And it's, this is really just about a big awakening. You know, it's, we're going to, uh, it's, we're going to get through it. You know, there was a New Yorker cartoon that showed two people next to a campfire and uh, in a cave. And one of them said to the other, well, at least for a short time in history, we brought profit to the shareholders. Uh, but I, but I think that actually, you know, we don't have to get there and we can, we can actually, you know, transition to a sustainable, thriving and spiritually aware planet and that the next generation can inherit such a, such a thriving earth. Uh, but it's really upon each of us to make our best efforts and, and to do our part. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And Pyle, last but not least, what's uh, giving you hope and inspiration? Yeah, sure. First, thanks to Mika and Jonathan. Those were really powerful spiritual insights. Um, quite moved by them. Um, one of my sources of inspiration, particularly during these tumultuous, you know, many months, um, is an essay that the Indian writer and activist Arundhati Roy wrote last year. I don't know if some of you may have seen it or read it called The Pandemic is a Portal, and it's essentially a call to action that we use our current global crises to really imagine and build a better future. And that's what's kept me going. I'll just read a short passage, some of which also harkens back to, to one of the points Mika made. Whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. In the midst of this terrible despair, the pandemic offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Wow. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much. Uh, I'm, I'm blown away by your expertise and your passion and inspired by um, everything that you said that's happening in local communities around the world. Um, I want to open it up for those that are, are with us. Feel free to put on your, your video screen. We'd love to see your faces. And you can either unmute yourself or pop a question in the chat. Uh, but we really want to take the last couple minutes to have an open dialogue conversation and questions. So feel free to unmute or pop your question in chat. Or raise your hand, all of those different Zoom things. Mindy, yeah, please. Hi, I'm uh, Zooming in from Philadelphia. This has been amazing. And here's my question. I mean, I don't know if anyone else gets um, triggered when they see Amazon, you know, everyone, and, and this was in the chat, you know, get this wonderful book through Amazon, which is a company that's very hard, like, you know, it's like getting off the web. I mean, I really don't shop Amazon. I think they're really bad for local economies, so on and so forth. And I'd actually like anyone to speak to the fact that Amazon is the go-to and its impact on our environment, packaging, the amount of flights, gas, so on and so forth. I mean, I'd be happy to share a word since I made that a book suggestion for my own book. Uh, and you know, a, a close friend of mine, after we published on Amazon, he said, "You got to, you got to take it off Amazon." You know, how, how how could you? Because and and in some ways, he's right because you know, we're turning the Amazon rainforest into Amazon packages. Um, and on the other hand, if we didn't use Amazon, then we'd be, you know, the, the market for, for books is, is significantly smaller. We, we also did publish on many other platforms. So our book is available on, uh, you know, the S Association of Independent Bookstores and uh, other, other non-Amazon platforms. Um, but it, it sort of relates to this deeper idea of, you know, uh, do we need to use the tools of the machine to change the machine or to deconstruct the machine? 
Um, and you know, that's true of Facebook. Why, why are we on Facebook? Um, and, um, you know, why are we using Microsoft word? Uh, why are we using Google? Uh, why are we flying at all? Why do any of us own a car? Um, you know, these are all deep questions. Um, why do any of us eat meat or dairy or eggs? Um, and, you know, uh, I was just on a podcast with an environmental purist who, um, who made me look like a consummate consumer. Um, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, we got to, we got to choose our paths. And, um, I think to be a purist and to forego using Amazon, um, would in, in my case, I think to be the detriment of, of my distributing the book. If I can just add one thing that <clears throat> I think it's a larger question, a larger question is, um, just, I think that one of the, you know, I'm amazed that we go through 12, 16 years of school and we never learn what a corporation is. And I think that one of the biggest issues in terms of how we're going to fix the world now is understanding um, the power of corporations, that the corporate corporations have a history, that they were, uh, that, they're, that, that they're a tool and that they're now a tool that has, um, that has, um, it's like, the, you know, sort of where they say the, the saucer's apprentice, uh, um, I forgot how to say it, in, I know how to say it in Hebrew, but, you know, you, you create something and we create the, the DNA of the corporation is law and we as a society created and we have the right to, to change and to make sure that the corporations really serve the common good. And in general, I think that that's what we have to do is we have to create a, a, a politics of the common good, um, an international politics of the common good. That's, that's, what's on the, that's what's on the agenda beyond Amazon and Amazon certainly part of it. So I want to be conscious of time. It's it's 11:02. Um, we're happy for people to stay on that would that would like to continue the conversation. But I just want to end with again thanking all of our panelists um, for all the work they do, um, and to all of Olam's partners that work on climate change and so many other issues within the the developing world, um, and for us to continue to think and act locally and globally. We know we live in an increased interconnected world. Um, I'll remind you that there's multiple events happening over the next few days and do one more plug for a panel on the Shemitah year that is happening on Sunday with um, Olam CEO, Diana Ginsberg, along with others. Um, and we send out an email after this with all the resources today, the writings um, and the organization's websites for you to continue to learn more. Um, and Olam is always here as a resource and a connector to issues around the global world. So wishing everybody a happy Tubishvat to remind ourselves of Adam and Adama, people and the earth are intrinsically linked. Um, and may we go from strength to strength in combating this um, huge crisis of our, of our climate. Thank you again to Micha, Yonatan and Pyle. We really appreciate your time and all the work you do. Thanks. Thanks to all of you, it's been great. Thank you. Okay. Looks like that's all right. it. Yeah, everyone's Unless blocking off. If you want to ask a question, you can ask a question of all of us. You can ask. <laughs> Rich, did you want to ask a question? You're muted. You're muted. Yeah, just hanging out. <laughs> no problem. If I, if I, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I guess, I guess uh, people asking, you know, what, what gives us hope? I. Uh, well, I took part in a climate uh, reality training this summer, and I was really impressed seeing all the, the young people around the world being involved, learning science, becoming politically organized. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't look for, I don't look to the United States so much for hope, but that's, you know, that that'll change hopefully. Um, um, but. Yeah, that was, and my, my congregation, there's a thirst for knowledge. So that's part of the reason I joined the, 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 the big bold Jew, Jewish climate fast is, uh, there's a lot of real thirst for information about organizations and ways to get involved. So 
like I'm saving all the chats and all the links and, you know, trying to remember as many names as I can. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm going to send a follow up email and you can always feel free to reach out and I'm happy to connect you to uh, to anyone or any entity that we've met. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the festival. There's some amazing events happening. Yeah. OK, thanks again. I'm going to take off. All right, all right everybody. Bye. 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 Awesome. Thank you both so Thanks. much. Thank you. Thank you. This was beautiful. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, let's send you muted. Thank, thank you, Amy, for, for your work. If I can just ask you a, a quick question, since um, uh, you know, I see that you're in Washington, D.C., right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I sent a message to uh, John Kerry's assistant about the possibility of collaborating in some way on religion and ecology with their climate change efforts. Um, and I didn't hear back, um, which isn't surprising because I'm sure they're very busy. Um, and I don't know this person prior to my sending him a cold email. Um, yeah. But I just thought I'd ask you since you know, you're know you here working in international development work and climate change and in DC, whether you have any insights and in how to connect to the new Biden administration around environment and climate and you know in, in my niche of religion and ecology. Yeah, so it might be more of a question for me to pose to our um, community um, to sort of learn from them who, who they have connections with. And I'll actually refer, refer to AJWS that works really closely with government um, agencies and has a lot of ties within the US American government. Um, Payal, if you have any connections or AGWS in general? Sure, yeah, we, we um, it's a great question. We have been working a lot with folks on the hills, even over these past four years of the Trump administration, but haven't yet sort of um, come up with our, our clear strategy, um, partly be, with the Biden administration, the executive, just because part of it's been wanting to see, you know, what executive orders come out um, in these first few weeks. And then from there, um, sort of developing a, a, a clear set of asks. So we'd love to be, you know, continue to be in touch because that strategy of ours, our advocacy strategy, and then our work with rabbis, um, which complements the advocacy work will, will be something we'll be building out in the next few months. So it'd be great to to continue to be in touch, and I can put you, Yonatan, in, in contact with our advocacy folks, as well as our Jewish engagement and international education folks, Milak and Hannah, who I mentioned, um, to see what there might, you know, what forms of partnership there could be, really leveraging the power of, of congregations and um, here in the U.S. and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would be amazing. Um, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to, for you to put me in touch with those people and, and to be in further contact. I don't know if, if you were at AJWS when Aaron Dorfman was still there. Yes, I see we overlapped for a bit. By the way, that's fantastic. I didn't know that you started with the, uh, the volunteer program. So that was a nice story that you added in. Yeah, that, that and actually of, of all the places I've been in the world, Ciudad Romero was the poorest place I've ever been to um, back in like close to 2000. Um, Aaron Dorfman was my youth advisor in, in my reform youth group growing up in California. Oh, that's wow. fantastic. Wow, he's, lucky. He's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Uh-huh. Um, so Yonatan, my work with Olam focuses a lot more on the Jewish engagement piece. So my sort of intersection with government organizations and that stuff is limited, but I'll definitely pose it to this to the team at Olam also to know beyond HWS who else might have contacts. Um, and you know, I might have some some personal individuals that I can put you in touch with just that, you know, have their foot in the door in government agencies. But let me pose it to the Olam team and see see what I can find out for you. Okay, amazing. That, that would be that would be great. Thank no you. guarantees, but we'll see where it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one well, other thing, I'll plug. Um, I know you've used Olam in Motion in the past. We're changing the categories again for sort of this like phase two of um, COVID relief, um, and they're you know just small subsidies. But one of the categories we're going to be introducing is to join various platforms around the world of international development practitioners. So that might be another way. There's some here in America. Um, to start reaching out almost like international development LinkedIn's for lack of a better uh, term that might help get you connected, particularly here in North America um, and, to the go and to government agencies. So just mm -hmm. another seed to plant. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would be amazing. And I mean, I, I just filled out the OLAM survey and, and I wrote that, that this session that we just did is in my mind, like one of the, the best 
areas that I, I feel like Olam has, has helped my organization. And so, you know, if, the, if you have other Jewish engagement opportunities to get in front of audiences, then yeah, Atov, that would be blessed. Amazing. Well, that's, um, we just came up with a three-year strategy and a huge focus of ours is doing, when, when it comes to the Jewish community, doing twofold, a lot of gateway programs just to expose whether it's leadership fellowships or organizations to the existence of all of our partner organizations, and also to really align ourselves with some um, already existing high impact fellowships and leadership trainings um, to bring our work more holistically into their agenda. So um, I think they'll be hopefully please God as we plant more and more seeds, more and more opportunity. Um, and one of the things we wanna present as a gateway program is a panel similar to this, talking about climate change in particular, because it speaks so much to the next generation mm -hmm. um, and a cause that they're tremendously mobilized around. So to be continued, lots of hard okay. work ahead. <laughs> yes, okay, amazing. Perfect. It's good to see both of you. You Great too, to thank you both so much again. To be a part of, really, I learned so much from you, Jonathan, and, and Mika, and the whole conversation was really terrific. Okay, great. And, and lastly, you said you grew up in Kenya, is that right? You know, I grew, my early childhood was in, was in Kenya, and then um, subsequently we immigrated first to the UK and, and then to the US in okay. the early 90s. Yeah, but okay. constantly. So we have family there and have a connection uh -huh. still with Kenya. And then, of course, luckily, I, know I get to focus a lot of my work, so it's just um, <laughs> it's a real privilege. Uh -huh. Yeah, awesome. amazing. Wow. Grace, well, good to meet you. Likewise, thanks for your thank inspiration. Thank you so much. Really thank powerful. you both so, so much. Okay. You as well. Thank you. Be well. Take care. Be well. Take care. <laughs>